So uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, Dr. Merritt talked a lot about uh, pain and, and its treatment. I'm going to talk about what a little bit of the science, what happens behind the scenes. All right. What happens behind the scenes? Um, okay, uh, next slide. Uh, that's the uh, clinical center, and uh, I'm a federal employee, so uh, I can't uh, lobby uh, with you to tomorrow. So uh, yeah, that's where I work. That's the clinical center at the NIH, which is about 10 miles from here. All right, next slide, please. So anyways, when you think of, I don't have a laser pointer, so when you think of uh, Chiari malformation, um, just look at the red. Uh, there's an underlying uh, pathology that, that starts everything up, and it's either a small posterior fossa, some people have uh, family members, there's a genetic component. Uh, environmental, some people present with uh, after trauma uh, with their Chiari, even though it's been there it's presumably their whole life. And then idiopathic, that's the most common type. You don't know why you have Chiari, but you develop it. And uh, that leads to hindbrain uh, herniation, which is uh, another name for Chiari 1 malformation. And then the symptoms come from either local pressure on the dura, which is the membrane around the uh, brain, or uh, obstructed uh, CSF flow. And you get symptoms uh, eventually that are in the yellow there, like uh, Valsalva headaches. That means that when you strain, you have a headache. Uh, occipital headache, occipital is the back of the head. Uh, bulbar, that comes from the, uh, yeah. uh, the brain stem here, the uh, medulla. He's a laser. He's a laser. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, here's the medulla here. That would, that would cause these things, visual, vestibular, auditory, which is hearing, trigeminal, uh, phonation, which is talking and swallowing. And uh, then lower motor neuron, that's your spasticity, and then you have the sensory and autonomic problem. So really, a mechanism means this starts it, and it goes, these are the ways that uh, it works its way through the nervous system. And uh, the, these are the manifestations. Those are what you feel. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So why do you feel the pain in the back of the, the head? Well, there are small nerves that go to the dura in the back of the head when you have Chiari. And those nerves are the same. Uh, they go to this distribution in the back of the head, this C2, 3, and C3. So that's why people feel the pain in the back of the head. Uh, with the Chiari. Uh, next slide, Caitlin. All right, so in children, it's a little bit different from adults, but not that much different. Uh, about half of the children have this occipital headache. Others can have cervical, so it can be other places in the neck. If the children are so young they're nonverbal, they can just have irritability, crying, failure to thrive. Some people have uh, shoulder, back burning pain. And then you have the uh, the syrinx uh, related symptoms and then the lower cranial nerve uh, dysfunction that usually comes from uh, the uh, Chiari itself. Next. Okay, in adults uh, it's uh, very similar exertion, strain type headaches, blurred vision, tinnitus which is ringing of the ears, swallowing problems, autonomic dysfunction. Obviously that's important to your group. And the signs are what the doctors uh, look for. Swelling of the optic nerve, uh, nystagmus, which is jerking the eyes, loss of the gag reflex hoarseness, um, and uh, impaired balance. <coughs> Next, please. So th these are just some uh, 28 patients that we looked at in our clinic with Chiari and syringomyelia. And, and you know, it depends, some people have severe headache at rest, but uh, about half the patients don't. Mo most patients have headache with cough. Some of the people have what's called dysesthetic pain, and that's, but, but not all of them. And, and that would be related to the syringomyelia. And uh, the ataxia is generally uh, thought of as a cerebellar symptom, and ataxia is unsteadiness. So about, uh, in our experience, about, uh, Four out of five people don't have ataxia, but some, some do, obviously. And 
and if, if you have a syrinx, most of the syrinx patients have sensory loss. Okay, next. All right, well, we went over that, so let's go to the next slide here. All right, so what symptoms are related to the syrinx? What symptoms are related to the Chiari itself? So here, the, we see patients that, that both have surgery, don't have surgery. Um, it depends on their symptoms. If their symptoms are stable, uh, and, and frankly, some patients don't want to have surgery, uh, we'll, we'll just follow them along. We'll see them once a year and, and get scans and so forth. So here are the patients. These are surgical, non-surgical. This is uh, broken up. Um, these are the primary syrinx patients. These just have a syrinx, no Chiari. These just have Chiari, no syrinx, and these have Chiari and syrinx. So you can see with our Chiari patients, most of them have pain on a zero to 10 scale with 10 being the worst. Pain that's more than the syrinx patients. You say, well, why is that? Why is that? And the reason is that the syrinx patients come in for syrinx symptoms. In other words, numbness, weakness, problems like that. And the Chiari alone patients come in for headaches. So they, our standard patient comes in with a Chiari they describe their headache as six over 10, which is very high on the pain scale, actually. However, on this function scale, which is zero to 100, our Karnofsky performance scale, they perform better than the syrinx patients because they don't have the spinal cord injury that a syrinx patient would have. So they have more pain, but they're asked to function uh, more. So. Uh, I guess that's a recipe for being miserable. <laughs> you have to work, <laughs> but you're in pain. Okay, so the next one, please. All right, so how do we decide? People have lots of symptoms with Chiari, and it's very difficult to decide what are related to the Chiari, what symptoms are related to the Chiari, what symptoms aren't. And so if people have occipital headache, Valsalva headache, headache with cough. Now, if you, have, you cough once, you have a headache, that can be what's called idiopathic cough headache. But if it lasts for th over 30 seconds or certainly over a minute after you cough, then that's classical. That's, that shows that you have a Chiari malformation. We also look for uh, neurologic symptoms, uh, the bulbar, you know, the swallowing, uh, phonation problems, uh, voice problems, ataxia, that's with the uh, cerebellum uh, being compressed, long track, this is the spasticity, and lower motor neuron. This would show that they had a syrinx. And then after we do that, we want to get an MRI scan to, to document that the, a Chiari malformation or a syrinx is present. So I'm a surgeon, so my pain control method is to do surgery. <laughs> uh, but don't fault me because for most pain, you want to treat the cause of pain. I mean, if this works, you don't have to use all the medication, that's the best. I mean, if you have a gallbladder problem, you could take medicine, you know, and every time you have a fatty meal, you have a pain here. But let's face it, if you have your gallbladder out, you don't, you know, you can eat as much bacon as you want, that's probably better for the rest of your life. So, so, um, so you, sometimes surgery is the way to go. So, with the Chiari, you want to relieve the cause of pain. And the pain is caused by the Chiari malformation blocking the CSF pathways at the frame and magnum. And if the surgery works out well, you have this nice passage which allows the fluid to go back and forth at the base of the skull. So basically, your fluid flow becomes normal. And uh, the pain is, uh, is improved, especially the cough headache, especially. Okay, next please. However, just because you have the surgery doesn't mean your pain and your symptoms are going to go away. If you don't accomplish the goal, in other words, if after surgery you don't have any more flow than you had before surgery, and in fact, in some cases, if the surgery doesn't go real well or you have, um, have scarring there, you might even have worse flow than you had before surgery and you could be worse off after surgery. So if a person has surgery and the symptoms aren't better, you should check into why uh, the symptoms didn't get better. And, and in our experience, uh, adhesions, which are the scarring here, 
bands that weren't cut, uh, not removing enough bone at the surgery. Those are the main causes. And, and oftentimes you can do another surgery and even though the first one didn't go well, the second one can correct what wasn't accomplished with the first surgery. All right, so next, next please. All right, <clears throat> so that's, that's pretty straightforward. So now I'm gonna just talk about sensation in general, just give you some background information, a little science for uh, Sunday morning. So let's uh, talk about sensation, and, uh, and this I'll relate this to pain and, and how, how you feel uh, symptoms at the end, so that I'm not on a wild goose chase here. So, <laughs> All right, so there are five basic senses. There's sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, right? And what's common with all those is they convert a certain type of energy, such as hearing, that sound energy, into neural en en energy, and the brain can understand that. Same thing with vision, that's light energy. Okay, next please. And then we have the other senses, like balance sense, position sense, temperature sense, and pain sense. And uh, so all those senses provide the brain with information. And um, you have these receptors in your skin uh, that you can't see, you can see it under a microscope. So if you press on the skin, they'll squeeze this little receptor here, which will put some energy into a nerve and you'll, you'll feel it. You'll feel it when somebody touches that, you touch the skin, there are little receptors around there. So sensation, you have touch sensation, pushing, pulling, movement, position sensation, heat sensation, hot and cold, and pain sensation, which is no susception. Next, please. And all those sensations are carried by certain types of nerves. You have little nerves for the pain, very small diameter nerves for pain and uh, temperature. And you have larger nerves for movement and for touch and pressure. So for nice sensations, you have big nerves. For bad sensations like pain, you have small nerves. Okay, so the next one. And all, all of them convert the mechanical changes in the skin into electro, electrical signals and the sensory nerves. Okay, next please. So say you touch the skin. That squeezes a receptor. The receptor uh, depolarizes and then you have these neurotransmitters that go to the sensory nerve and the sensory nerve fi fires and that goes to your spinal cord and you feel the touch. So the next. And with position sense, you have these receptors either in the muscles or in the joints and those sensations through larger fibers than uh, pain fibers, they go to the spinal cord too. And that they tell the brain where your extremities are in space. So next, please. Now this is pain. This is unfortunately, pain doesn't have a receptor. It has uh, blind nerve endings. So if you stick your skin with something sharp, it goes right to the nerve. And, and obviously that's, you probably have that uh, feeling yourself, uh, you know, with pain that it's, you just have raw nerve endings there. Okay, next, please. And uh, it's, not, it's not only uh, sharp uh, sensations that cause the pain. You can have changes in the, the uh, acidity, uh, chemical. You can have mechanical, which is like stretching, heat, cold. All those go through the same pathway, but they eventually go through the spinal cord and make their way up to the brain. Next, please. Okay, so this is how things, uh, sensation makes it to the brain. The everything goes in the dorsal root, as Dr. Merritt was talking about. It, pain go, touch goes in, proprioception, temperature goes in, and pain goes in. It all goes in through this this root, but they go up to the brain through uh, different pathways, and they make it to the the part of the brain where you feel where it is. In other words, you stick in the foot you feel it in the brain, in the foot area. Um, but unlike touch, which is, it will tell you where it's at. Uh, uh, next, please. 
uh, pain goes to other places because you need a reflex. You, you, you stick your foot with a nail and you have to pull back your leg real fast. So you, the reflex allows you to pull it back before the sensation even makes it to the brain. All right, so pain is uh, suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injury. It detects, the receptors detect tissue injury, the brain interprets it. And you can have it in the soft tissues, it could be in an internal organ, or it could be referred. And that's what why you have pain in the back of the head with the Chiari. It's referred from inside the head, and that's where you feel it, in the back of the head. That's called referred pain. If you have a stomach ulcer, the stomach's here, you feel it around your belly button. So that's, that's called referred pain. Now, pain can either be short and intense, or it can be chronic. And, uh, you know, it can be continuous and severe. And pain is very important. It costs the U.S. about $600 billion a year in treatment. So you can mention that to the uh, senators and congressmen tomorrow that it's, it's a major problem. Okay. And pain, unlike the other senses, there are several places they end up, but they end up in the emotional areas of the brain, like the amygdala and the reward centers, in, uh, which are like the amygdala and the hippocampus. So pain means a lot to you. I mean, obviously pain, people don't want to be in pain. And it goes to the amygdala, this is like the fight and flight part of the brain. And, and so, you know, you're off balance basically uh, emotionally because if you're in chronic pain, um, Okay, so next please. Okay, so what what can you do about that? Uh, well, as I said, you have these small fibers for pain and you have the larger for touch and pressure. So next slide, please. And there's this gate theory of pain. So I'm, I'm talking about mechanism. I'm saying what, what happens behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, you have these small fibers come in or pain and temperature, they come into the spinal cord, but they're blocked. Some of their sensation can be blocked by these larger fibers. So that's why nice things help to block pain. In other words, massage and exercise and, uh, you know, not getting some activity and doing good things and happy things, they can block some of the pain sensation. Not, not all of it, but they can certainly help. All right, so let's get back to, to practicality. So if you have pain after surgery, you have to evaluate to see if the cause of the pain was relieved. And did the Chiari-1 decompression relieve the obstruction of the CSF pathways and the dural compression? And you also have to see if the surgery caused some spinal instability. It, that would be a new thing. If that occurred, then that might require a fusion people are talking about today. If you need medication, you have to realize that medication doesn't treat the cause of pain. It just, it provides temporary pain relief. Now that might be the only, there might be no absolute cure for every symptom you're having. So it's, um, you might need to do that. I mean, this might be the best solution or some people don't want to have surgery, and they say, look, I take a couple of ibuprofen a day. I said, well, that probably you know, would be at least that miserable after surgery. So, and, and a lot of them say, well, sure, then I'll go without surgery. And they, but they have normal function, neurological function. And uh, so some people decide their symptoms are, are minimal enough that, although not absent, they, they don't want to have surgery. But the medication doesn't treat the cause of the pain. It only causes temporary pain relief. And when the medication is done, then your symptoms return. And, the, and there are non-pharmacologic alternatives, as, as were mentioned before, massage, physical manipulation, uh, electrical stimulation, herbal medications, outdoor activities, things, things like that. All right. And um, 
You also have to remember that you know you can get opiates from places other than the uh, opium poppy. You know, um, you know have poor poor farmers uh, growing it in South America and uh, you know Afghanistan. Uh, they they're going to keep growing it. They need to to make a living. So uh, these aren't going to go away. But uh, you can make some in your own body. Your body makes uh, enkephalins. Uh, that's an endogenous opioid peptide. Your body releases them during uh, pain or distress. You have endorphins, dynorphins, endomorphins. So there are four categories of morphines that your own body makes. So if you do enjoyable activities, you will make some morphine-type drugs, opiates, yourself. Okay, next slide. All right, and then one last thing. This is my last slide. The surgical decompression of TRI1 malformation won't improve symptoms arising from another condition. So if you have a he headache of a, another type, migraine, muscle tension, headache, it won't help that. Some people with Chiari have Chiari and they have migraine. So, and if they have symptoms from both, and you say, well, I did the surgery, they still have headaches. Well, if, they, if you've got them down to the migraine headaches, then you can treat the migraine headaches with migraine medication. Some of those people are very happy. So just because you have migraine headaches doesn't mean you don't have Chiari headaches. You can have both. But you just have to realize that. Okay. If you have pain unrelated to Chiari or syringomyelia, that's, that's probably not going to be relieved completely by the surgery. Like if you have arthritis, musculoskeletal pain, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, that's not going to be helped by the Chiari surgery. Of course, if you have both, maybe the surgery will get you part way uh, to, to getting better. When you look at studies and somebody says, oh, I, you know, my results are great, all my patients go back to work, they're all happy. The, the results of surgery are very dependent on who you select. If you take on a tougher patient group with, with migraine headaches and, and some you know, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, perhaps Ehlers-Danlos, your, your treatment outcomes aren't going to be the same as people who don't have those other what comorbidities. So you have to realize that when you, when you see patients for, for certain doctors. Okay. All right. And a lot of times, if, if you do have conditions and symptoms unrelated to Chiari, you need medical management, not surgery, and you need an expert who's an expert in those things. And uh, so, okay. Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>